Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. When Christ died on the cross for your sins, He was buried and rose again the third day. You would believe and trust on the Lord Jesus Christ. He would save you from sin, save you from the wrath of God. Why don't you trust in Him? Believe on Him. Don't wait another minute. Trust and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved from your sins. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day. My name is Brother Ed, and I'd like to welcome you to KJV Bible Scope, and we are on a Romans Overview series. We are on a part 155, part 155 of the Romans Overview series, and we are in the midst of Romans chapter 14. And as we're looking at this thing in Romans 14, we are looking at the judgment seat of Christ, and we are looking at these aspects of the judgment seat of Christ concerning the inheritance, the rewards, the crowns, and ruling and reigning with Christ. Now, all of that is under the banner of motive. If you want to have anything when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, you would do well to have the right motive. The motive concerning loving Jesus Christ in all things concerning what pleases him. And that would be the scriptures. Now, when you go to the scriptures, what you find is how to please God. People think they can please God their own way. They can please God by just obeying their hearts. They think if, if they decide according to their standard in how to please God, that somehow God will be pleased. But the Bible says when we come to God, we must come to God on his terms. We must come to God according to his way. We must come to God according to the standard of his righteousness, not our own. And so people are confused with this thing. They think, well, God knows my heart. And according to what I feel is right, according to what I feel will please God, somehow God will be pleased. And that is a false conception. Um, I don't want you to fall into the banner of believing a wrong way, whether it's the wrong way to salvation or the wrong way to live your life for Jesus Christ after you're saved. Now, people fall into the banner of both categories, and I'll say the banner, they actually live those two categories, and it's an ever-present reality that, that we deal with every day. People do not understand that God doesn't appeal to us. God doesn't subject himself to us, and then he's saying, well, I created you so I can be your slave. And that's what people think their God is, because I say their God, because that God doesn't exist. It's a God of the imagination. It's a God that's a, of, of, of a made up fairy tale. Okay, but the God that I'm speaking of is the God of the Bible, the one true God that you know exists and that I know exists and that all of humanity knows that exists, but they choose, not everybody, but most choose to hold the truth in unrighteousness. So with that being said, guys, let's go ahead and go to our verse in the Bible in Romans 14, 10, as we get into this topic of the judgment seat of Christ and expounding upon the inheritance and what it is and what can happen if you if you can lose it or not lose it now look at this let's go to romans 14 10 here let's turn to the bible and the bible says but why dost thou judge thy brother or why dost thou set it not thy brother for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of christ for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so that every one of us shall give account of himself to who? To God. 
Okay, so everyone's going to give an account, as we said in the prior scopes. I mean, everyone is going to bow both knees on the ground. Every tongue shall confess to God. You're not going to confess to a priest. You're not going to confess to the Pope. You're not going to confess to your pastor. You're not going to confess to your mom or your dad. You're not going to confess to, to the King of England, friend, the, or the Queen of England. You're not going to confess to any of these people. You're going to confess to God. And that's the problem, guys. People are too worried about, about confessing their sins to a man confessing whatever to a to a person and they're not worried about God now say you did confess your sins to the priest what is that going to do for your soul the Bible says that we are to take our sins to God directly we are not to take our sins to a man we're not to take our sins to a priest or a statue of what they think Mary looks like or what a saint looks like these are all inventions of man and we don't pray to statues and flip beads and do do these things what we appeal to is the one true God now let's back that up before we get into this aspect of the judgment seat of Christ because we are dealing with salvation and if you can't even get salvation right how are you going to deal with the judgment seat of Christ you're not going to be able to deal with it because you're not going to be there if you're not saved so the focus is first you need to be saved then these teachings of the judgment seat of Christ will apply to you. Now, let's do, let's do 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Now, I'll show you. You don't take your sins to a man. You take your sins to the one true God who came down as man. Okay, now watch this. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now notice it says be made for all men, not to all men. Do you see that? I don't confess my sins to every man that walks up to me. He, I don't answer to him. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's if you're saved. Now if you're not saved, you're going to stand before God at the great white throne judgment. And th this is going to be determined whether your name is written in the book of life or it's not written in a book of life. So that's the point. So what we want to do is make sure that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So all these supplications, all these prayers, all these intercessions, all these giving of thanks, um, I'm, I am to pray to God for all men. Okay, concerning all these things for kings and for all that are in authority. Oh, couldn't we learn something from 1 Timothy 2 2 today? I mean, in this day and age, everybody's cursing the government, everybody's cursing their president, everybody's cursing their rulers and leadership. Oh, friend, we need to obey the Bible as Christians and not worry about what society thinks, what society does, what media says, okay? So 1 Timothy 2, 2, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all, now look, in all godliness and honesty. See, the problem is there's some that want to lead a quiet and peaceable life, but they still want to live a life in dishonesty and they want to live a, a wicked life. The opposite of godliness. Guys, people think just because they live a quiet and peaceable life that somehow, well, no bad thing has happened to me. So what, what makes you, Mr. Christian, better than I am? Not, not a whole lot of bad things have happened to me in my life. I pretty much lived a quiet and peaceable life. Here's the problem, my friend. Living a quiet and peaceable life doesn't save you. Living an ethical life doesn't save you. Living a moral life doesn't save you. But people will try to challenge Christians and say, well, well, Mr. Christian, you're such a hypocrite. You, you've did this and you've did that. And you sinned that sin and you did that sin. So I know wicked people that live better than you, Mr. Christian. And that is a valid argument. And that would be completely and utterly true. There are people out there that are not saved that probably live more ethical lives than Christians do. Now, it's a sad thing to say. I, I don't say that in any kind of pride. I say that to my shame, to Christianity's shame. 
that Christians ought to be living for Jesus Christ. Now, if Christians are living for Jesus Christ like they're supposed to, according to the word of God, then no lost person can walk up and say, well, I know lost people more ethical than you are. Because if you're dealing with Christians that are living according to the standards and truths of the Bible, and they don't try to justify their sins by saying, well, you know, it's okay. You know, everybody else is doing it and, uh, and appealing to the word of God. What you'll find is that it'll be a whole lot harder to condemn Christians on a, on a normal level of being unethical, immoral, wicked, and so forth, okay? Um, it'll be more harder to call a Christian a hypocrite because he's living for Jesus in every way he can. Now, that's not to say he doesn't make any mistakes. That's not to say he doesn't still sin. All people sin, whether you're saved or whether you're lost, okay? That's the point. This is what people don't understand, so what we're looking at is if you're leading a quiet and peaceable life, according to 1 Timothy 2, 2, you're, living a, you're leading a quiet and peaceable life. What you need to live in is in all godliness and honesty. Now, godliness comes from the Bible. Honesty would be honesty according to the standards of God, not according to your own honesty, because a lot of people think they're honest as they're robbing you. They say, well, I didn't rob you, man. I just took a $100 for, off, off the, the table in your house. I didn't steal it, though. I don't classify that as stealing. And you see, their honesty is skewed. Their honesty is in subjection to what they feel. But we are appealing to the Bible, and God says when you're appealing to honesty and godliness, it needs to be according to the word of God. That's how we define honesty, according to the mind of God. And where's the mind of God? It's the word of God, the Holy Bible, correct. See, it's all practical, okay? You can understand a lot of things in the Bible once you get saved and you start learning practical application every day in life. The problem is people want this miraculous salvation which changes their lives. Which, which means they don't sin anymore. And they, they always do everything that's righteous and right. And that's, there's a problem with that. It's not biblical. You don't find this stuff in the Bible. Where do you find this kind of teaching? In charismatic churches, you find this teaching in, in Joel Osteen and, and Benny Hinn and Joyce Myers and all of the reprobates that are on the TV that want to tell you, oh yeah, you can get saved, just be a better you. And that will save you. And that's wrong, my friend. There's only one Savior, and we're about to read it right here in verse 3. Now watch this. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. What is acceptable? Living a quiet and peaceable life, but not just that, but living in all godliness and honesty. Now look, who will have all men to be saved? Now does he want all men to be saved or just a certain few Calvinists? Does he want all people to be saved or a certain elect few? Does he want all men to be saved or just some chosen black Hebrew Israelites? Does he want all men to be saved or just the Jews? Okay, so you got to ask yourself these questions when you read the Bible. And what do you got to do when you're reading the Bible? You got to read it in all godliness and honesty. Can you do that when you're reading the Bible? Well, let's do that when we live our lives and let's do that when we read our Bible, right? So who will have all men to be saved? So every single human being, God wants to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now, here's the question. This is the will of God, is it not? Now, what, what Calvinists will tell you and what all those, those idiots on the Internet will tell you, they'll tell you that God's will is over-encompassing. Nobody can defy the will of God. God has got a sovereign will that does not change. He's got a will that lasts forever. It's eternal will. Well, here's a problem with that kind of theology, my friend. 1 Timothy 2, 4 says, who will have all men to be saved? So ask yourself the question right now. Are all people saved right now according to God's will? No. The answer would be no. So that sovereign will of God is, is completely foolish. It's absurd. It's unscriptural. So people walking around saying God's got this sovereign will, they're foolish. They have no conception of what the Bible really teaches. Because if God's will is sovereign, then right now, in time past, in time future, everybody that would ever be born would be saved. But that's not true. You couldn't say that. Because you walk around every day and there's lost people all around you. So the Bible says who will have all men to be saved, which not all men are saved. And come to the knowledge of the truth. So here's the truth I'm trying to bring. 
that God wants all men to be saved, but he won't control you to get saved. Do you see that? You have a free will. As God has his will, you have your own will. And it's, free will is not an illusion. Free will is an ever-present reality. In fact, if you don't want to obey Jesus, you don't have to, and he won't make you. You could reject God. You could reject the cross of Christ, his finished work on the cross, that he died for your sins and rose again the third day. You could reject that. And you have the free will to do so because God has given you the reality of free will. No, when you reject God, it's not God's will that you reject him. But that's what Calvinists will teach you. It's not God's will for you to reject him. He wants you to be saved even after you reject him. If you're still living in this, this, this body of flesh, if you still got your faculties of conscience and self-awareness, God wants you to be saved. He says, okay, you rejected me now. Will you trust me in the future time? I'm still going to appeal to you. I'm still going to try to prick your heart with preachers and teachers and people that preach the word of God to you, whether it's out on the street or they go door knocking and knock on your door and tell you the good news of Jesus Christ. Look, it's never too late as long as you got the breath of life in your lungs. The problem is, is people think because they lived a sinful life or they, 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 according to their standards, they live so much sin that somehow that, that there's no way for them to be saved. That if you were in war at wartime situations, you were a soldier and you went to Afghanistan or something, you killed a bunch of people. And you killed pregnant women, you killed babies, and you accidentally killed these people, and you accidentally killed that family. And then you come back to the United States and you're all beat up and you say, man, I can't forgive myself. There's no way I can live my life. I have, I have, I have thoughts of, of suicide. I want to die. Now, I dealt with people like that in time past. Um, in, as I was coming up in the ministry and dealing with people when I lived by a government base, and I dealt with people on, on a post, on a, on a government base, and we went door knocking, we tried to appeal to soldiers, and we tried to appeal and, and try to get them the gospel of Jesus Christ, and a lot of them cannot forgive themselves. They say, there's no way God could ever forgive me because of all the killing and murder that I've done, and they see themselves as murderers uh, that, that, that are without salvation, that God just cut them off. There's no way they can be saved. And, and see, guys, when I say you, you can get saved if you want to, it's easy just to come out and say that, but see, when I give you the situations and I give you the circumstances, now when people come in these circumstances, they say, wait a minute, I can't be saved. There's no way God will allow this. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. And then you show them the cross of Jesus Christ, how Jesus Christ died the death that belonged to you and me. And we show them that Christ has paid the price for their sins. He died for murderers like Paul. Paul was a murderer in the Bible. He wrote 13 of our New Testament epistles. We got David who was a murderer. Come on. He, he slept with one of his soldiers' his wives and then killed the soldier. And you know what? God is willing to forgive. If you would truly repent as David did, if you would truly repent as Paul did, if you would truly repent like the Philippian jailer did in Acts chapter 16, who was about to kill himself because he thought Paul and Silas escaped the prison and he was in charge of keeping them in prison. And he's like, oh no, I'm, I'm surely going to die because they escaped. But they didn't escape. And you know what they did right before this, this Philippian jailer was about to kill himself? They said, stay thine hand. Don't do nothing to yourself. And then he asked them, what must I do to be saved? He knew his body of flesh was about to die because he was going to take his own life. And now when he sees that there would be no reason for himself to take his own life, because Paul and Silas were still there, they didn't leave. So he wasn't going to get killed for them escaping. So guess what? Now he asked them, wait a minute. These guys got godliness and honesty, 1 Timothy 2.2. 2. What must I do to be saved is what he asked Paul and Silas. And you know what Paul and Silas did? They told him. They told him the way to get saved. It wasn't do good works. It wasn't be walk in the spirit after you're saved and you can maintain your salvation. You know, you know what he said? He didn't say get baptized. He didn't say get religion. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. 
It's as simple as believing. You say, it can't be that easy. It can't be. And then I tell you, the devils believe and tremble in James chapter 2. So when I say believe, I don't mean just know the facts. When I say believe, I mean trust. What Jesus has did on the cross for your sins. You need to believe on the facts in a sense of faith and trust. And then and only then can you get saved, my friend. But knowing the facts don't save you. So when I say believe, it's a believe in the sense of faith and trust. Okay? So there you go. Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, can everybody come to the knowledge of the truth? Yes. It is possible for anybody to come to the knowledge of the truth. There is not like one person more smarter than somebody else and that one person can get saved and, and everybody else can't. No, God says, I made this simple for everyone. Even the simplest individual, the simplest minded individual, somebody that's uneducated, what, what, what the Bible calls a barbarian. A barbarian doesn't mean savage. A barbarian means uneducated. Okay, that's the Bible terms. Now, if you want to go by Google terms or you want to go by your, your Western modern culture terms, you can go ahead and do that. But when we're learning the Bible and learning the mind of God, we're going to see what, what God says about what a barbarian is. Now, God, a barbarian is uneducated. Now, even an uneducated man could trust in Jesus Christ and be saved from their sins. It's that easy. You say, well, you, you got to speak in tongues in order to stay saved. The problem is, what do you do with, with people that were born without tongues? What do you do with people that had their tongues cut out, say it, they were prisoners of war and their tongues were cut out, and then they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and they get saved, but they can't speak in tongues? They're not saved? What do you do with the people that have aquagenic or to carry and they can't get baptized? Come on, if you say getting saved is getting baptized in water, what do you do about the people that have aquagenic or to carry? That's a disease where they can't get in the water. So they can't be saved? See, you guys see this. God made salvation easy that anybody could believe on Jesus Christ, that he died for their sins and rose again a third day. You simply trust and believe like the thief on the cross did, and you're saved forever. Okay, so you, I hope you guys see that. Now look at verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Now notice the word man there. When we're dealing in the man Christ Jesus, it doesn't take away from the deity of Jesus Christ. The Son of God makes Jesus Christ fully God. And when the Bible calls Jesus Christ the Son of Man, it makes Jesus Christ fully man. See, this is the problem with people when they read a ver one verse in the Bible. They take that one verse and they write it right into the ditch. Guys, you got to read the whole Bible. The Bible gives truths for the humanity of Christ, and the Bible gives truths of the deity of Christ. So you got both in the Bible. But what do people do? They only focus on the verses that deal with the humanity of Christ, and they say, see, Jesus was just a man. See, Jesus was just a man. See, Jesus was just a man. But then you talk to the Christian that believes the Bible, and then he'll quote you all the deity verses. See, Jesus was just, see, Jesus was God. See, Jesus was God. See, Jesus was God. The problem is, is that there's both represented in the Bible. Jesus is fully God and he's fully man. So when I'm giving you 1 Timothy 2.5, it's not an attack on the deity of Christ. It's showing you that as Jesus Christ came to earth, the, come on, what, what did it take to bring God to man? What did it take to bring man to God? It would take somebody that's fully God that can bring God to man and somebody fully man to bring man to God. And Jesus Christ fulfilled both. He's fully God, the deity of Christ. That was, that's what was inside that body of flesh. And then he's fully man, the outer shell of that flesh. Do you see that? So there is one God and one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus. So the truth that's being brought forth in 1 Timothy 2.5 is that if Jesus Christ just didn't come to save you, he also came to mediate for you between God and you. So that's the proof of him being fully man, making it possible for there to be a mediation. That's why we don't need Mother Mary. That's why we don't need the saints. That's why we don't need a priest or a pope. All we need is Jesus Christ. 
He's the one that mediates. He's the one that hears our prayers. Now, I, we covered that. Now, look at this. Let's go to 1 John. Let's back it up. Let's go to 1 John. Now, let's go down to verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, people say, well, we're going to apply this to lost people. That's not applied to lost people, friend. 1 John 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, all five chapters are dealing with our fellowship with God as saved members of the body of Christ. Nowhere in 1 John does it teach you can lose your salvation, okay? So if we say we have no sin, that's saved people, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice it doesn't say to get saved again. We have a body of flesh we have to live in every day, even though our soul is saved from the penalty of sin. So if our spirit, because man is spirit, soul, and body, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, if we yield to the, the Holy Spirit, then things are pleasing to God and we can be blessed. But if we sin, we don't lose our salvation. What we have is we're dealing in unrighteousness. And now the wages of sin is death concerning the, the body of flesh, not the soul because you're saved forever. So what do we got to get right? Our relationship with God according to the body of flesh. Okay? So what do we do in this body of flesh when we sin? Come on, our soul is saved forever. It's justified before God. But our body still sins. Come on, because we desire to sin because of our spirit. Our spirit is just our choices and our will. But, the, but we can choose which one to do. So if we sin, what, what should we do if we sin? Okay, there's the instructions right there. If we sin as Christians, we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now look at verse 10. This is if you're a Christian today. If we say that we have not sinned, and you'd be surprised how many people that are claimed to be saved, that claim to be alleged Christians, they say they don't sin anymore. Are you serious? If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Guys, when you walk around and say you don't sin anymore, you're calling God a liar. That's what it says in 1 John 1.10. And what else does it say? And his word is not in us. Because you're not getting that truth, or if you want to call it a truth, you're not getting the, the opinion that you don't sin anymore from the Bible, from the word of God. And so his word is not in you. It didn't say you weren't saved. It says his word isn't in you. You need to go to the word to learn what it says. That once you confess your sins and realize you're a sinner, even after you're saved, come on, people are still learning even after they're saved. You don't, you're not automatically knowing the whole Bible the moment you're saved. You got to learn the Bible. So you got a whole bunch of alleged Christians that don't learn the Bible and they think that I have to be an instantaneous righteous person and I can't do it. And, and I would agree with you. There's no way any, I don't think anybody can immediately live every truth in the Bible instantaneously the moment you're saved. Nobody can do that. Jesus didn't have to do that. He was righteous from his birth, from the birth in the body of flesh. We're talking about the humanity of Christ, not the deity. Jesus Christ is eternal, eternal, eternally past um, in eternity and co-present with God, okay? And Because Jesus is God. So let's not get that confused when I say stuff like this, because people will get this stuff confused when I make statements like this. So if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So if we agree with God that whether we're saved or whether we're lost, that when we sin, we need to take our sins to Jesus Christ, both if you're saved or lost. And if you acknowledge that you are not a sinner anymore, then you make God a liar, whether you're saved or lost. And his word is not in you, whether you're saved or lost. Now, obviously, if you're lost, his word could, couldn't be in you. But I tell you this, the Holy Ghost pricks you according to the word of God. Now, come on, let's, let's go ahead and keep going because I know, man, we've made so many pit stops and rabbit trails away from our topic of the judgment seat of Christ. But we needed to understand that when we confess our sins, first of all, we are sinners, even as Christians. And second of all, 
if we're confessing our sins, we don't need to confess our sins to a pastor or priest or Mother Mary or, or flip beads or, you know, pray on steps and lay on beds of nails. We don't need to do all that. All we need to do is confess our sins to God, to Jesus Christ, because he's the mediator between God and man. And that's all we need to do. People make this thing so complicated. They got to go through one billion and one ceremonies to get right with God. No, you're not going to purgatory. No, you're not going to be cleansed somehow. No, you're cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ the moment you were saved. And now all you need to do is fix the relationship whenever you mess up. Come on, when I mess up with my wife, what do I do? Do I got to go get married to her again every time I mess up? Or do I just apologize to her? Do I just say, honey, I'm sorry. I messed up. I'm going to try to be better. And you know what she does? She forgives me. Because she sees me more than just a stranger. She sees the vows that she's given me. She sees the promises that she's given me. And she says, no, for better or for worse, I'm going to be with my husband. And so I don't need to go get married again every time I mess up. So why are you applying that thing to salvation? How come every time you mess up, you lost your salvation? Okay, now I always got to come back to that because it's always an issue with people. It's always an issue. People just can't say Jesus paid it all. They can't. And if they do say that, a lot of people lie about that. They don't really believe Jesus paid it all. Because if you don't live for Jesus, if you don't do X amount of righteousnesses or X amount of holiness, if you don't go to church all the time, and if you don't do right all the time according to everybody's standards, that you were never saved to begin with. That's a problem. The Bible don't teach that. No, that's a man-made teaching, and it's wicked. All right, let's keep going. I, I, I'm glad we covered that. I think it was, I mean, from time to time, it's good to go back to salvation and, and eternal security and things of that nature. So people understand that when we're dealing in the judgment seat of Christ, we're not dealing whether you're losing your salvation, whether you're going to hell or heaven. In the judgment seat of Christ, we're dealing with how you live your life for Jesus as a saved person. And God is looking at your motives and how you lived for him. So you can't take that and throw it to the ditch and say, well, I don't care about inheritance. I don't care about, you know, crowns. I don't care about ruling and reigning with Christ because that's not even a factor. Every time you sin, you lost your salvation, and that's completely absurd. People can't get past that. It's just crazy. And they can never teach inheritance. They can never teach anything besides losing your salvation because that's, that's their heart. They need to threaten you with losing your salvation so you'll live for Jesus Christ. It's wicked. Look, if you're not going to live for Jesus because you love him, Jesus don't care if you live for him. He doesn't care. Come on, do you really think you're honoring God if, if you're thinking that somehow you're going to go to hell so you better live for Jesus? Jesus says, no, I'm not dealing in fear. Fear is what you need to, before you get saved. Fear is a good thing that you, that you need when you get saved. When you're like, wait a minute, I don't want to go to hell, but Jesus loved me enough to die for me, so I'm going to trust in him. But now after you're saved, he's not hanging hellfire over you anymore. Well, you better stay saved. You, you better stay saved. God, there's no verse in the Bible that tells you to stay saved. Once you're saved, guys, it's really easy. It's like when, you, when you're in an airplane and the airplane's about to crash. And your father's on the airplane. He gives you the only parachute on the airplane. He says, son, I want to give you my parachute. The only parachute. And I brought it just for you. I don't. I didn't really think about myself bringing, giving the parachute, but I want to give you my parachute here for you. Jump out of this plane. It's about to crash and pull the cord. And so you jump out of the airplane, you pull the cord. Your dad saved you. And he died in the plane crash when you could have died in a plane crash and your father could have been saved. But it's the other way around. He gave his life for you. Now, now after you, now, hear me out. Now, after you, you touch ground, and the parachute goes down, you touch ground, and you go home. Will there ever be a time when you're at your house or when you're out in the world, when you're with your friends or when you're out at the sinful bars, you're out at football games watching naked cheerleaders? Okay, when you're watching all this stuff, is there ever a time where it will ever change that your dad died in the place of you? No, it will never change. History is set. Your father died in that plane crash. He gave you that parachute. Nothing could ever 
turn the hands of time back and change that ever-present truth. It's history. It's happened. Okay? Now, there's no actions you can do to change history. There's nothing you can do to change the fact that you put the parachute on and trusted in it, right? So how are you saying that once you get saved by Jesus Christ, that somehow you're going to turn the hands of time back and untrust yourself from Jesus? You can't do it. The moment you trust in Jesus, the initial act of faith seals you into the day of redemption. There's, there's no way out of it. You couldn't get lost. You couldn't get undone. You couldn't go to hell if you wanted to because you're saved forever. All right, guys, the transaction has been made. God doesn't go back on his promises. Once he says you believe and trust in him and you're saved, he doesn't go back on his promises because that would make him a liar. If you're walking around telling people that you lost your salvation, and I, I have never talked to somebody that does that, by the way. Go, oh, I lost my salvation. I lost my salvation three times. I don't ever talk to people saying that. I, I always talk to people that tell you you can lose your salvation. But, but when you ask them, have you ever lost your salvation? And they say, no, no, I, I, I can't lose my salvation, but you can lose yours. <laughs> It's crazy, guys. See, this is this not in the Bible. So what we're going to do in KJV Bible Scope is we're going to appeal to the Word of God only. We're not going to appeal to Brother Ed's emotions, his feelings, how he sees it. We're not going to appeal to my how I grew up and my worldview. We're going we're gonna to learn the Bible, the Bible and what it actually teaches, okay? So there you go. Now, that was an ultimately long opening for my judgment seat of Christ. But we, what we'll do is we'll make a couple more statements, and then we'll end the scope, and then I'll start a new scope and continue on with inheritance. Now, watch this. Now, let's go ahead and go back to 1 Peter chapter 1. Now, watch this. Now, we hit this on the, on the last scope, but let's hit it again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, that's dealing with saved people. Do you see that? It's t dealing with us right there that have trusted in Jesus Christ. But notice that we are begotten again. Now, what is this begotten again? Is that salvation being born again according to John 3, 3 and John 3, 7? No, this begotten is dealing with being renewed daily, being renewed daily by the Spirit. You say, how so? Let's, let's look at this thing. Now look, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a what? lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Notice it's to a lively hope. It's to a lively hope not to get saved again. Come on. My hope is renewed daily. It's a lively hope that I have. And it, it, it comes by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now look, look at verse 4. This is the purpose of the begotten us again. To an inheritance. Incorruptible. Notice it's not dealing in two salvation. We're not dealing in salvation. You could lose your inheritance and still be saved. Why doesn't anybody teach that? Why do people always make everything about losing your salvation? Now, 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 now look at this. Here we have an inheritance that's incorruptible and undefiled. See, it's better than any inheritance you could get on the earth, right? Right? Where should your treasures be, here on earth or, or in heaven? The Bible says your treasures ought to be in heaven. But if your treasures are on earth, moth and rust doth corrupt that treasure. Come on, your treasure is going to be corrupt. And what's going to happen once you leave this earth? Will you take those treasures with you? No, you won't. Will you take that inheritance with you that you got from your mom and your dad or your ancestors? No, you won't. You're going to die and you're going to leave all the treasures of this world behind. All the rewards that you had on this earth, you're going to leave them behind. And if you're a king or a queen today and you got a crown, you're going to leave those crowns behind because they are corruptible and they fadeth away. But what are we dealing with the, in the inheritance that's incorruptible? Look, it's undefiled. Look, moth or rust doth not corrupt this inheritance. Now look, and fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. 
You know what we're dealing with the crowns in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ? We're dealing with something that is undefiled and that fadeth not away. But here's the problem. Could you lose your crown? Sure you can. You can lose all five of those crowns if you wanted to. And believe me, the way Christians are living today, or alleged Christians, I don't see any crowns coming to any of these people. Come on, the Laodicean lukewarm Christians, you really think they're getting crowns? We're, that's just crowns. We're not even talking about the inheritance. We're not even talking about rewards. We're just talking about crowns. Are people really looking for the appearance of Jesus to come? Are people living their lives in such a way waiting for the, the appearance of Jesus to come? No, they're not. They're out at the bar. They're out at the club. They're out at the raves. They're at the rock concert. They're out smoking weed. They're out fornicating with women and women with men and men with men and women with women. And they're just out there living it up. What's the problem? The problem is they're thinking, well, God's got grace. God will just, God will just forgive me. Sure he will. Nobody's saying God won't forgive you. He'll forgive you. But what about your motives in serving God? What about the judgment seat of Christ? What about your inheritance? What about the crowns? What about ruling and reigning with Christ? Do you not want to do that in eternity? And your answer would have to be no. Or your answer is going to be, wow, I didn't know that was available to us, Brother Ed. Is that really in the Bible? Yes. The problem is you got a bunch of carnal preachers that only preach salvation over and over and over again, and they never preach anything else in the Bible. That's the problem. Now, now look, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved. Now, now here it is. Look at this. Reserved in heaven for you. Is it reserved in heaven for you? Yes, it is. Now, let's do this really quick because people still get confused no matter how many scopes I do on the same topic. People won't watch the prior scopes. So I got to constantly reiterate what I've already preached, I don't know, like a hundred times already. So let's preach it again. There are aspects of your inheritance that you can lose. And there are aspects of your inheritance that you can't lose because God has promised you these things forever. Okay, now the things that you can lose, that's depending on you. The things you can't lose is dependent upon the promises of God. And you know God doesn't lie, so there's no way you can lose certain aspects of your inheritance. Let me give you an example of one aspect of inheritance you can't lose. And I already did this in a prior scope. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12, or yeah, 12, 13, and 14. Now look at this that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. So what do you got to do to be saved? You have to first trust in Christ, right? I mean, one time, one act of faith in your life and you're saved forever. No matter if you don't trust Christ anymore. Once you have that one initial act of faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are locked and loaded forever. Now let's prove that. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth. So you trusted in it? Why? Because you heard the word of truth, not the heart of truth, not believe in yourself truth, not Disney truth, not Oprah Winfrey truth, not Dr. Phil truth. No, the word of truth. That's the Holy Bible. The words right out of the Holy Bible. Now look at this. The gospel of your salvation. Now what is that? The gospel according to the Bible is Christ died for your sins and was buried and rose again the third day according to scriptures. You trusted that and believed on that, right? That's the gospel of your salvation. In whom? That's Jesus Christ. Also after that ye believed. You see that? That's not an empty belief. That's a belief of faith and trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ according to the gospel of salvation. Ye were what? Sealed. Sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, did it say that you might be sealed if you live a good life? And then you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise? Or does it say you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise? And notice it comes immediately after you believed. Now look at verse 14. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Unto the praise of his glory. Now what do you notice right there in verse 14? 
you have an earnest, a down payment of your inheritance, which is the Holy Ghost. And you can't lose that earnest of your inheritance. There's no way you could ever lose it. So I just proved that case, okay? We just proved it according to the Bible. Do you see that? Now, look what it says. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Now look at verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God through faith, Unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now watch this. Who are kept by the power of God? How are you kept? Are you kept by the power of God? Yes. Now here's the problem that people want to give. Okay? They want to use the next two words after I got it highlighted right there. 1 Peter 1, 5. They want to say, the wait a minute, but it says through faith. Do you see it? Right there. Through faith. So they're trying to prove that you have to have faith in order to be kept by the power of God. Okay, let's go ahead and read what it actually says. Through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, you are kept by the power of God through faith. Now, whose faith are you kept by? Your faith or God's faith? Do you see that? See, people will always want to read whenever it says something like that. That's your faith. It doesn't say your faith there. It says through faith. Unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, I want to show you something that I can back that up with. Now, we're in 1 Peter 1, 5. Now, watch this. Let us go to Galatians chapter 2. Now look at this. We're going to go down to verse 16. Now look at this. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by his own faith. No, it doesn't say that. It says by the faith of Jesus Christ. Do you see that? Even we have believed in Jesus Christ. Now see, now we have to believe, we have to have faith in Jesus Christ. But look what it says, that we might be justified by the what? By the faith of Christ. Wait a minute, that's not my faith. That's the faith of Christ. So I am justified by the faith of Christ, not by my own faith. So who's keeping me? God is keeping me by the power of God through faith. And that's the faith of Christ. Do you see that? Hopefully you guys see that. Um, it's, I know it's kind of hard. I'm kind of flying through some of these verses. But look at 1.5. Who are kept by the power of God through faith. See that? That's the faith of Christ right there. I, there's nothing that I can do to keep my salvation. There's nothing I can do to maintain my salvation. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation not not see is it say through faith in order to get salvation see that it says faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time now now the whole glory of salvation the fullness of salvation will be revealed in the last time when your body and your soul and your spirit is conformed to the image of his son then you will then you'll see the fullness of the salvation revealed in the last time. We're not saying there's three salvations. We're saying there's three aspects to the salvation of a believer, okay? And the three aspects are the salvation of the soul. That happened at the cross. The salvation of the spirit. That happens in a future time. And it's also going on constantly every day. And the salvation of the body. That happens when the rapture comes and there's a resurrection of the dead and your body is changed. Then both spirit, soul, and body will be changed to be conformed to the image of his son. So hopefully you see that ready to be revealed in the last time. So we did that, I think, fairly well. God reserves an inheritance for you in heaven that is undefiled and does not fade away. Okay, so let's do one more verse and then we'll... We'll call it a scope, and we'll try another scope in a little bit, Lord willing. And let's do Matthew 21, 38. Now look at this. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, 
let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. Now, we could read the whole Matthew 21, but I just want to uh, just reiterate, because I know we covered this before, but um, we are dealing with inheritance and the attributes and, you know, the truths of inheritance concerning the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, now, seizing. There is a seizing on an inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. Verse 39. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, that will, that will he do unto those husbandmen. Or what will he do unto those hus husbandmen? Now look. They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men. And will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. So Jesus said unto them, Did ye ever read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same as become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So there can be a seizing of your inheritance, and I'll, this, this is what I want this is what I want to say. If you let somebody seize your inheritance. Come on. While you're living on this earth and you're living for Jesus Christ and you're trying to do right, you're trying to walk in the spirit, you're trying to do the things that please God, to do the things that honor Jesus Christ. And then out of the blue, you finally get weary and well-doing. You start getting tired of serving Jesus. You get tired of serving God. I'm tired of church. I don't want to go anymore. I'm going to stay home. I don't want to go. To, I don't want to do nothing. I just want to do what I want to do. Well, you know what's going to happen? You are going to let these wicked men come and seize your inheritance. Now, who could be classified as these wicked men? It could be your friends that would turn you from Jesus Christ. It could be your own desires. Those could be wicked men. Your own desires could be wicked men to seize your inheritance. It could be your, your flesh is wicked men trying to seize your inheritance. Now, are you going to let these men seize your inheritance? Let, 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 let's, go ahead, let's go a step further. Will you be one of the physical men that seize other people's inheritance? Are you going to be a stumbling stone for other people that are living for Jesus Christ and make them lose their inheritance? Because you know what? There is a judgment for both. There's a judgment for both. I wouldn't want to be the one to be classified as stealing other people's inheritance and seizing other people's inheritances. I don't want to be the one to do that. But you know what? There is a whole lot of people seizing people's inheritances right now. And you know what? And there's a lot of people out there that are letting people seize their inheritance. Will you get restored your inheritance if it's seized? Will you get restored your inheritance if it's stolen or given away or sold? The answer, my friend, will be coming up soon, Lord willing, in my grand finale scope dealing with restoration, okay? We're not going to cover that now. So you can see there's a truth of seizing on inheritance right there in verse 38. So I hope you guys see that. Now, I don't want your inheritance to be seized. I don't want you seizing other people's inheritances. And we're dealing according to God, the inheritance that you can get at the judgment seat of Christ and the aspects of it that you get the moment you're saved. I don't want to see anybody lose any of their inheritance. I want everybody to get their fullness of their inheritance. But that's just not, not a, a truthful factor because the way people live their lives every day, they, they could care less. Okay, so... Here's the deal, guys. Here's the deal. And we'll kind of close out here with this thought. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ left his home in heaven and he came down to earth to die for our sins. He could have stayed in heaven and let us all die. He is worthy. He had what he had. He had all the glory from before, from before the world began. He had all the glory. Now, why is he going to come down and let man take glory from him? Why is he going to let man do that? But he did because he loves us. 
He did because he cares for us. He did because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God selflessly died for our sins. Would it not be a good thing to live our lives in the right motive for Jesus Christ? That way no person could seize on our inheritance because our inheritance is rooted in love for Jesus Christ. Our inheritance is rooted in pleasing God according to the word of God. Friend, you would do well to trust not only the fact that you are saved and your initial salvation was trusting in Jesus, but to continue to trust in Jesus Christ and the word of God and live your life in accordance with the truths of the word of God the practical application in your life every day. I hope you consider that. I hope that you'll stop being that carnal Christian. I hope that you'll say, you know what? I'm tired of being a mediocre Christian. I'm tired of being somebody that just comes short willingly because I want to come short according to God. As a Christian, you don't have to do that anymore. You could get a Bible, King James Bible, read it, and live your life according to the truths of the word of God, and you could live your life in victory, in victory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what you'll find is blessing that would come from loving God, blessing that would come from pleasing God, blessing that would come from doing things for God in your life every day and making choices concerning God every day in your life. And then you know what ultimately in the end, when you die and you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, what you'll find is nobody has seized on your inheritance. What you'll find is you'll get the fullness of your inheritance. Not only crowns for always waiting on Jesus Christ, always being temperate in all things, always winning people to Jesus Christ whenever you can, always doing those things that honor God. What you'll find is crowns waiting for you. You'll find ruling and reigning awaiting you. You'll find rewards waiting to you. And even when you didn't really want those things, Come on, we're, we're speaking truthful here. Even though you didn't really want inheritance, even though you didn't want a mansion in heaven, even though you didn't want none of these things, all you wanted to do is have fellowship with Jesus Christ. All you wanted to do is honor Jesus so you could have that personal relationship with him. Personal relationship don't come by you getting saved. A personal relationship comes as you live your life for Jesus Christ every day in your life according to the word of God. I hope that you guys see that because, you know, a lot of times when we witness to people, we tell people, no, you know, we don't believe in religion. We believe in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's easy to say. But no, we want people to get saved first. And then we want them to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But they will not get the personal relationship with Jesus Christ just because they got saved. Okay? Personal relationship comes by actually having a personal relationship. Do you see that? Praying to God according to the word of God. Obeying God according to the word of God. Believing, believing things in your life according to the word of God. Living your life and having a worldview according to the word of God. Your marriage. Doing things in your marriage according to the word of God. Having friends according to the word of God. Going to places according to the word of God. Making choices about what, what to do and how to do it according to the word of God. See, people don't live their lives that way. They live their lives according to what they want to do, according to their emotions and feelings. That's not a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So why don't you get the right motives today, my friend, and line your life up with the word of God and thus having a relationship with Jesus Christ and then what you'll find is their motives are more and more correct. So when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you get a full inheritance, you get full rewards, you get ruling and reigning with Christ. And these things will just be a blessing to you. They won't be the focus of why you do them, but they'll certainly 
be a blessing to you, okay? All right, guys, uh, thank you for uh, listening here on this KJV Bible Scope. I hope you guys go back and you watch these things again. Go through these verses, read them in their context, know what you believe, know why you believe it, as opposed to just saying it somewhere in the Bible, okay? So, guys, thank you again for joining me on this KJV Bible Scope. My name is Brother Ed, and may the Lord richly bless you guys. Y'all have a great, a great and wonderful evening.